we've been uh, on this sort of journey, this sort of series on following Jesus, and um, been sort of working through the second half of Ephesians, and we've come to a, a really good part, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. And sort of we're nearing at the end of our journey. We've covered a bit of territory. We Hopefully we've heard from God through his word. And I pray that we've allowed ourselves to be challenged by that word. Whether it's not just been water off a duck's back or off a tin roof. This challenge to live life in a, in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. But that challenge is not simply for us to do better. It's not about doing better. But it's really a call and a challenge to ground ourselves more in the grace of God by the finished and completed work of Jesus. And it's from that place at the foot of the cross, from the empty tomb, from the filling of God's spirit, that we are called to live that challenge. God's not standing in heaven saying, do better. Do better. You're not doing good enough. We're being encouraged to live lives that are distinctively different than the world around us. Do not live like the Gentiles do. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 17. Do not give the devil an opportunity, he writes in verse 27. Follow God's example and walk in love just as Christ loved us is how he begins chapter 5. And go on being filled by the Spirit is how he keeps on going. Relationships are being, are being governed by submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And Christ is surely the centre of all of this. He is, as the old hymn says, our hope and stay. He's the source of our life, and our life is hidden in him. This message is part A. I'm sorry, part A of two parts of this passage. It just got big on me. Today we're going to talk about verses 10 to 12. Next week, hopefully, 13 to 20. We're going to read the whole text, however, because it's, it's important. We're going to keep this together. So let's read uh, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Finally. Isn't that good? When you hear the preacher say, finally, you know he's nearly finished. But that's not true today. Finally. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. It's a great passage. The whole thing divides itself neatly into three parts. We're only looking at the first part today. But, just so we know how it fits together, let me tell you what those three parts are. Shall we? That would be good. Um, we could think of this passage according to its 
three main commands, it's three primary commands. The first is to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The second is to stand. Three times in two verses we're told to stand. And the third is to pray. Part one sets the context for us. Why do we need to be strong in the Lord? Because we're in a spiritual battle. Our enemy is the devil. And we do not battle against flesh and blood. Part two is about how we stand. What do we need to have to do and be in order to stand firm? We put on the full armour of God. And part three is what we do when we stand. We pray. Four times in three verses we're told to pray. And twice Paul makes a specific request of the Ephesians. So let's get into it. Part one. So what we're covering today, part one, we're in a spiritual battle. So, just to remind us, um, let's read these verses again. Yeah? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I just feel we need to pray before we unpack this. Um, yeah. Father God, this is um, not something we often give much thought to or our attention to. And Father, we, um, we would pray, Lord, that as we come today under your word, under your living, powerful, life-giving word. We ask that you do a work in our hearts and our spirits. I, I pray, Father, that as we go through this today, Father, the stuff that we've done already today, the stuff of, around prayer and around communion, Father, I pray, Lord, that that would have new meaning in and for us and the things which we've stuck on the cross would be stuff you deal with even this morning. Father, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Finally, 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 he says, finally, when you're reading the letter, you think, finally, he's nearly at the end. And he is. Finally, in order, this is why he has this here, in order to do everything that we've talked about as we've talked about this letter. Everything that he said we need to do we need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We cannot, as many I want to do, is cut these verses off from the rest of the letter of Paul. We just take them away and say they don't refer to that anymore, as if Paul was giving some master class to us about something that's unusual, only for a few people. If we think that all we have to do in order to do what Paul has commanded us to do in this letter is to battle against the internal desires of our flesh that tempt us from our memory in order to live a life worthy of the calling with which we have been called, then we are mistaken. Sadly, very mistaken. But because we have a propensity to chop the word of God up, into bite-sized pieces so that we can handle them easily and sweetly. These few verses have often been taken out of Ephesians, placed in isolation of their own. We need the truth of these verses if we are going to be effective followers of Jesus in whatever, uh, in whatever time we're in, whatever place, sphere of influence. God has planted us. Now there are a plethora of understandings when it comes to the spiritual battle we're in. And many of them are driven by experience. As people have tried to understand what they've witnessed, what they've read about or what they've heard about. 
I would be very surprised if some of those various teachings or stories have not been part of your story, what you've heard and seen and experienced. Many of us have heard teachings, been exposed to various things, including demonic possession, demonic oppression, territorial spirits, Ouija boards, evil spirits, tarot cards, horoscopes, a whole host of other stuff. The list can go on forever. Either you've experienced them, or you know someone else has experienced them, or you've read something, or some teachers come through and taught about that stuff or whatever. And I get that. We live in a world where these things exist. Probably one of the best lies the devil has told ever since the rise of the scientific age has been that he doesn't exist. That's a good, good lie. And that is neither the witness of scripture nor the experience of people, especially those outside the Western world. The spiritual battle we are in is a part of life. It's not just for the few exceptionally unfortunate people. And it's not just found in the things we consider overtly evil. It does no good to immerse our head in the sand and say, it does not exist, it does not exist. As if saying your truth, or what you want to be true, is going to change anything. On the flip side, the reality of the spiritual battle is not going to be a continuous rerun of The Exorcist or some other horror movie. Demons are not hiding behind every bush or under every rock. While dark powers are pervasive and mean humanity no eternal good, they are often not frightening. They're just deceptive. So what is Paul talking about? This is all by way of introduction, isn't it, really? What is Paul talking about? And we've got to get this part at least generally right. Otherwise, we're going to have trouble with parts two and three next week. So in doing that, let me ask two connected questions before seeing what Jesus has done about them. They're big questions. They require much more thought and prayer and application than an ordinary week will give us. So I'm likely to be a bit of a blunt intro this morning, not particularly nuanced at all in answering them, so that will leave some aspects unanswered and rise, give rise to more questions, but we're going to press through. This is the first question. What are the devil's schemes? What are they? They're lies. 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 Not statistics. Lies. Lies about you. Lies about others. Lies about himself about the triune God, about what God has done in Christ Jesus, about the world, about what you need and about how you get it. He lies about all of those things. Deceptions, manipulations, distortions of the truth. The devil hates us. The devil's playbook are variations on a theme, which is the destruction of faith in Christ, hope in Christ, and love from Christ. If he can, through the deception of lies, the manipulation of truth, and the dissection of God's word, get a person or thing to undermine any of those, he's able to influence the outcome of events. The scriptures and our lives are full of examples of these things, both significant and seemingly insignificant of how the devil influences people, families, and events. The first sin recorded in the Bible is the devil's lie to Eve. Yeah? The first sin. The devil's lie to Eve. And we know how that worked out, don't we? One of the Bible's most troubling accounts is when God and Satan talk about Job. I don't know if you're troubled about that. If you think that that's just... Well, really... We can do without that, Lord. Just do without that. Satan, by his deception and distortion of the truth about faith in God, hoping God and love from God, 
tries to get Job to believe that God is not good because he's allowed all his possessions to be taken and all his children to be killed. And he wants, he wants Job to believe it's pointless, pointless to hope in and believe in God if it comes to no earthly blessings. So Job should just curse God and die. In fact, that's the advice that Mrs. Job gives her husband. She's had enough of this. Joseph's story clearly shows the devil's influence, even though the devil's not mentioned, which is nice for us. The devil whispers in Joseph's ear about how he deserves to be dad's favourite. Gives his ideas on how Joseph's brothers might rid themselves of this troublemaker. He fills Mrs. Potiphar's heart with lust and entices the cupbearer to forget Joseph's knowledge and gifts. If he can get Joseph to forget God's faithfulness, give up on God's love and lose hope in God, then he might just win. Jesus too was subject, wasn't he, to, to the schemes of the devil. In the wilderness, the devil tempts Jesus to believe his lies. In the three temptations, the devil seeks, seeks to get Jesus to disobey, dishonor, or disbelieve God. He does this by lying about his worth, so Jesus might worship him. He does this by undermining Jesus' trust in his Father by pointing to Jesus' need to turn the stone into bread. And he does this by challenging the authority of the Father in Jesus' relationship with him by misusing the scriptures, taking Jesus to the top of the temple and so to throw himself down because angels would, would catch him. If we are tempted to lose hope in Jesus, to think our relationship with him is not one of love, grace and faith, but of performance and slavery. So that it's more about us than about Jesus. Then know that the devil's fingerprints are all over it. He's enticing you. He's lying to you. You know, that I read something just the other day that... Uh, Biblical humility is not about it's not thinking less about ourselves. And pride is not thinking so much more about ourselves. Well pride is. But biblical humility is not thinking of, of ourselves as much. We're not the centre of things. And we know that when we're not the centre of things, we're moving in the right direction. We sort of forget about ourselves. But when we become the centre of everything, the devil's fingerprints are all over it. His schemes manipulate the truth, distort what is real about God's love, about the hope we have in him, and about the role of faith in coming to God. All of which are only found in Christ Jesus. All those things are found only in him. And the devil uses rulers, authorities and powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil to help him. That's what he uses. They're his tools. So our second question then, our second question is, who are the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil that Paul talks about? Because there's not a list, all right? There's not somewhere we can go to in the Bible that this is what Paul's talking about here. And this is where I get a bit blunter, if I haven't been blunt enough. The identity of these enemies is quite unclear to our Western way of thinking, except for the powers of this dark world. We see these dark powers at work in materialism and consumerism, in greed and lust, and rampant individualism and lots of other ways. We can see evidence of 
of these dark powers at work in our world in the primary relationships Paul described earlier in the letter. Remember those relationships? Yeah? Remember them? Husbands and wives, parents and children, employer, employee. Remember those relationships? We see dark powers at work within them. They consistently seek to undermine the relationship between employers and employees through a lust for money and a lust for power. We see them behind the manipulation of parent-child relationships through the devaluing of parental authority and parental blessing and the rise of individualism in every facet of life and being, everywhere. And we can see how they seek to distort and destroy the relationship between husband and wife by devaluing the sexual union through the promotion of pornography and the sexualization of almost everything. Chairs, probably. I don't know. And they're removing by removing distinctions between men and women, by dissolving their identity markers, as well as a whole lot of other things. We know that he lies, he manipulates, he distorts. The schemes of the devil. Yeah. And we don't have to look very far to see all of those things, do we? Don't we? You turn the television on. You turn the television on and you see it. Don't you? Or am I the only one who sees it? It's not demonic possession or oppression that makes these things happen. So there may have been some of that at its instigation. But the devil does need dark systems and at the very least malicious uninformed intent to manifest these things through a culture and a worldview. Isn't this fun? It's different for us to think like this. Some suggest that the evil spirits and rulers and authorities in the heavens are solely referring to pagan or tribal religions, not the washed, white, Christianized Western world. If you read an older commentary, it will be like that. And there's truth in the first part of this, but certainly not in the second. It's more than likely that the worship of other gods in other religions, that the belief of God being in everything, that the belief that there is no God at all, is the worship of rulers and authorities in heavenly places, the worship of evil spirits. Our multicultural world has brought many new religions with them. But this land already had its own spirits and its own objects of, wor of worship. They come new, and while there may be some redemptive analogies among them, they only ever serve to point to Jesus as the way to the Father and that salvation is found in Him and never to their own deity. Those redemptive analogies, those things which people might see, those things in another religion about perhaps about sacrifice, perhaps about the making of peace between uh, to, to cultures, they are, they are only there to point to Jesus. They're not there as an end unto themselves. And we can see the schemes of the devil in the lie that all religions ultimately lead to one true God, given that Jesus is the only way to the Father and there is salvation only in his name. And that is a huge lie. A huge deception, is it not? But isn't that paramount in today's world? Isn't that what nearly everyone believes? If they believe in God at all, they believe they must be all pointing to the same God. It's all fine. It doesn't matter who you believe. The Word of God says something quite different. Our God is quite unique. And you can't have it both ways. We can't believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father and that there are other ways to the Father. It doesn't work. 
They're not two sides of the same coin. Not a coin at all. <coughs> we also see the individualization of truth. So that there's only your truth and my truth in every sense. As opposed to Jesus being the truth that defines the narrative in which our lives are lived. Our individual and cultural perspectives are certainly a truth that should not be ignored, but that does not mean they weigh the same as Jesus. But the law of idols in the West, each with their rulers and authorities in heavenly places, and the invitation of evil spirits invited into people's lives through practices they know are associated with the occult, the worship of other gods and the like, should not be ignored, underestimated or hidden from view. There is demon possession and the more common demonic oppression. The, there are occultic practices that do have real effects in people's lives, even if those lives are not involved in the practical worship of false gods, evil spirits or the devil. Just because people don't do Satan worship in our streets does not mean that they're not in some way bowing their knee to him. But if these things be true, what has Jesus done about them? What has Jesus done about them? And this is really important, isn't it? So it's really heavy, isn't it? Talk about this stuff, it's really heavy. You feel like you're carrying a ton. Yeah? But the point is, what has Jesus done about this? This is why Ephesians divides so easily uh, into two bits. A great thing about what Jesus has done for us, and then he talks about how we should live. Yeah? Ephesians 1 to 3, which we didn't look at, is all about what Jesus has done for us. And then 4 to 6 is about how we should live. So it's really important, this bit. What has Jesus done for us? What has he done about them all? Colossians 2, 13 to 15 tells us, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it, nailed it to the cross. The cross. Those things which God wants to work on in our hearts and our minds, those sins. He's nailed them to the cross. Yeah? Now, having disarmed the powers and authorities, these are the same powers and authorities that he talks about in Ephesians. He made a public spectacle of them, not our sins, public spectacle of the powers and authorities triumphing over them in the cross. The scriptures tell me that Jesus not only defeated the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil, he shamed them through a public display of their defeat on the cross. The picture Paul is drawing upon for us comes from the Roman Empire. When a Roman general defeated another army, there were occasions if the victory was especially noteworthy, that the conquered general and the conquered people, conquered army, would be led through Rome in a public procession and celebration that was designed both to pour praise and honour on the victorious general and pour contempt and shame on the defeated ones. This pouring of contempt and shame is what Jesus has done on the cross when he defeated the devil and all the powers and evil we have described. All of them. All that weight, all that heaviness, all the, the, uh, the demonic oppression, demonic possession, all of that stuff we talked about, Jesus had defeated them on the cross. So the Word says, so we need to believe what the Word says. 
adapting the certificate against us that was held by the devil and reminding us of it was one of his favourite ploys has been nailed to the cross by Jesus. Jesus has paid it in full when he died in our, part, in our place. There is nothing left to be paid. Nothing at all. All paid. Paid in full. The stuff on there, paid in full. Jesus' victory is displayed through his resurrection and ascension. So that he's described in Ephesians 21 as being far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. These rulers and authorities, these powers, these spiritual forces whom Jesus has utterly defeated are under his feet. They are nowhere near him. They can't get close. Isn't that good? Now, as a result, he does get better. As a result of Jesus' power and work, so clearly seen in Jesus being far above all rule, authority and power, Paul also describes the followers of Jesus in Ephesians 2.6, where he says that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This places us, in a spiritual sense, at least far above these things we wrestle against. So these rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil are at once the, the defeated foe of Jesus, but also real foes against whom we wrestle. But they cannot ever, ever, Take what is secretly hidden in Christ. They cannot, because it's seated in Christ, with Christ. When we hear the devil whisper in our ear, if you keep doing that sin, you will lose your salvation. You'll be finished. God will not want to look at you anymore. He will not want to have anything to do with you anymore. When we're doing that stuff which Leslie talked about, and if you did not hear the devil whisper in your ear, it was because it was whispering in mine that God would not have wanted to have anything to do with me because of what's in my heart. It's not true. My salvation is hidden in Christ. It is with him seated in the heavenly places. Is it not? That's all the Bible, that's what the Bible tells us, isn't it? Yeah. But the devil's lies and the trickery wants me to forget that. wants to think is about my performance. How good I can be. They can't reach that salvation because it's in Christ. And he is far above every rule, every authority, every power. That we do not work wrestle against flesh and blood tells us that our weapons against these foes are not according to flesh and blood either. Rather, we use spiritual weapons for spiritual battles against spiritual foes. While we are in a spiritual battle, it's a war that Jesus has already won. We also have victory over our foes, but only in Him. That's why the passage begins with, our, with the command. Memorize the whole Bible so you can, can uh, battle the de demons with the memory of your Bible which you've got in your head. And that's how our passage started, was it not? Or, or perhaps it was learn all the songs about praise so that when, when that, you can... Starts with this. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then to put on the full armour of God. In Christ is the only place we have victory, only in him. But it's a victory we have to walk in, or more, or more correctly, 
the victory we have to stand in. So it's not one that just appears. It remains on us regardless of where we are in life. We know that, don't we? Because we know the trouble we have with the whispered thoughts. We know. Well, at least I know. I know the trouble I have. I don't know about you. Maybe you know, I've got cast iron ears. Can't hear the devil whisper. I don't know. The thing that Paul wants to talk about next is how we can remain in that victory. How we can stand. But for today, it is more than enough, I think, for us to recognise that we are in a spiritual battle. We suppose that are spiritual rather than carnal. They are powerful and influential. But Christ has overcome them and in him we overcome them too. Cool? Let's pray. Father God, this, is, um, this isn't stuff we, we talk about very often. And Father, I probably made a huge hash of it. I don't know. But Father, I pray, Lord, that we might be encouraged to remain in you, remain in Christ. That, Father, we might be reminded that we are in him and of what he has done. And that, Father, the roars of the lions, Father, would not frighten us. That, Father, we would be, Father, strong in you. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We've got one song.